Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. We're all about the stories that make Asia one of the most dynamic, one of the most exciting tech ecosystems in the world. Today, to help us get a better handle, understand what's going on in the Asian market, especially when it comes to digital marketing, joined by Phil Townend. He's an ad tech entrepreneur. Chief Commercial Officer of Unruly in APAC, one of the world's leading social video platforms. He's also a board member of IOB Singapore. We're going to talk about that, as well as his notable successes, which include helping raise $25 million for Unruly. We're going to talk about that, as well as life as an entrepreneur, making the move from a successful career in Europe to Asia, and the future of digital marketing technology in high growth markets beyond the view. Phil, welcome to the show. Hello. Great to have you here. Now, before we get started, you're a friend of Simon Kem. I'm curious, because <laughs> he was the one that referred us onto you. Are you, uh, are you a member of Simon's Secret Whiskey Tasting Club in Singapore? Um, I have been known to attend one or two of his uh, little events. I wouldn't say I'm a connoisseur. Um, I'm trying to get the taste of whiskey. It's something I've desperately been trying to achieve for about 20 years, but... Uh, PT whiskies uh, unfortunately escaped me, but I have been known to uh, share a beverage or two with Simon, yes. Fantastic. He's very secretive about who's in and who's out of that club, but he does share his preferences for whiskey. But that's another story. We'll go there another day. Let's talk about your or background. another evening. Exactly. Now, you started in digital, well, especially in the, the, I suppose we can say in the video space in digital marketing quite early on. I'm just looking at your background here. And if I may just share with the listeners you know, what you did before you came here. Yep. You worked for 24-7 Media, which yeah. people may or may not know as Real Media beforehand. I think it changed its name to 24-7, didn't it, initially? I'm not sure that the complete story there. But yeah, it was 24-7 um, Media Europe was part of, was the European arm of 24-7 Media Inc., which was a, a rival network to double click uh, at the time. And then, they both retracted back across the Atlantic and uh, and then kind of merged that side and then came back into Europe again. So after the dot com bubble, the original uh, the initial dot com bubble burst, um, there was a bit of a retraction in kind of ad networks and stuff like that, and that's what happened there. Right. So this was an ad network. You also worked at the agency with everybody mispronounces the name Kara or Kara. Yeah. Pr written carrot for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. So you you were in agency and the ad side of things very early on and yeah i mean i did that was before digital actually so i started in a broadcast team um so i was doing tv and planner tv planning and buying for like amex and uh and news international at the time the newspaper group in the uk so i kind of had cut my teeth on on moving images let's say audio visual but on the kind of the tv and cinema screens um which gave me a good background um for when kind of video started to explode in the mid noughties right and you were, uh, well, from the TV side, you worked for Flex Tech. I mean, they were, yeah, were yeah, they part yeah. of Virgin at the time or were they were acquired by Virgin? I don't know the relationship there, but people may or they may not. Telewest. Telewest. They were right. Telewest. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the big cable group then came and bought the, the, the media arm. I think it was quite a, a popular move at the time in the late 90s, early noughties that big kind of telcos were buying content businesses to try and kind of build out full service value added propositions. And that was just one of those. Right. So the point being is you were, in that space 20 years ago and you yeah. saw i mean that's about as as far back as you can go you know theoretically that's kind of where it all started especially on the digital side of things and you know obviously fast forward to where we are today a lot has changed but when you were working in that space 20 years ago did you see for example on the video side of things that that was the future because you know this was long before even youtube was a, an entity right did you see anything at back then that made you think oh that's the future you know this is where it's going when you know we were back in 1999 1998 this was still an era of netscape and aol cds right? yeah alter vista and people like that <laughs> Um, so, I mean, look, I mean, I think people can look back and backward engineer their career moves in kind of some grand plan. Um, but, you know, I kind of fell into advertising in the first place and I got a job at Cara and then it became quite clear to me that I was probably a better, better on the kind of commercial side than I was necessarily chained to my desk, me, uh, doing, you know, planning and buying. So, uh, I made the move across to FlexTech and they had a range of, you know, they had a range of kind of, uh, TV assets, but they were also building out, 
digital assets that, you know, companion sites to their kind of TV channels across music portfolio and female portfolio, portfolio and stuff like that. And it was the kind of the, the rise of multi-channel. Um, and the bit, the stuff that was floating my boat wasn't necessarily selling TV airtime. It was, um, when we were doing like sponsorships that included the digital components or the digital sites and we were bundling all that together and then selling it to the, to the kind of clients. Mm. And I realized at that point that there was a huge, huge opportunity that was kind of being underexploited, I think, because digital at that point, um, and for quite a few years afterwards was almost given away free of charge as an afterthought to try and protect core revenues around TV or print or radio, you know, in traditional media sense. So um, the, the the role at 24-7 came up and I got into that and that was kind of like still 99. So it is quite early and I do remember vividly my boss at the time saying to me, why are you leaving this job now and going to this internet advertising thing? Internet advertising is never, ever going to take off. Mm. And uh, this gentleman, you know, still has a very senior role in a radio station. Um, but, you know, there are some people who, you know, are still addicted to traditional media and that, you know, that's fine. It's still, still big business. There's a few of them still around, isn't there, obviously? So. Yeah. <laughs> Dinosaurs. Exactly. So at the time he was saying, this is when you're making the move to 24-7. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And traditional media really didn't get what it was all about. But at the time, fair enough, it was really a percentage of a percentage for these guys, right? I mean, oh, yeah, it's fractional. So they really didn't understand it. They didn't have to understand it. Was there a mindset shift as well? So you came from a traditional media background. You were now going into internet advertising. You know, I guess the traditional media background was born really of that sort of big idea advertising in the day. If you go back, yeah, you know, another yeah. generation, you know, the, the big ad agencies and the creatives, the Ogilvy's yeah. and the Saatchi's and everything, you know, those big sort of 30 second commercials. Blockbusters. Exactly. You know, the, people talk about things like diamonds are forever and, you know, the best ad agency, the best ad campaign of the 20th century. That's yeah. what everybody grew up with, wasn't it? And I suppose a lot of yeah. the ad agencies, ad execs, had that as their kind of blueprint of what it should have been. Did you see yourself still sort of influenced by that generation when you moved into internet? Um, I think you get a bit of a shock when you move out of a traditional media business into a more digital kind of uh, focused business because you become a lot more accountable. So I think, you know, traditional businesses, whether they're you know on the agency side or the, uh, the kind of media owner side, I think the, the targets and stuff like that are a lot more uh, collective. Whereas, you know, you go into internet and everything, you know, you have to basically sell and, you know, bonusing is around what you bring into the business and blah, 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 blah. And also, you know, you're representing a bunch of, a range of media across, you know, different types of business models. So at the time it was really interesting because these business models were just emerging. So some of our publishers that we represented at 24 seven was stuff like breathe.com, which is, you know, in the UK was a, a famous early ISP that was providing, you know, internet connectivity uh, via dial up that kind of spent lots on TV advertising. We had handbag.com, which was the original kind of female site that then became part of Hearst. Blah, 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 blah. You know, probably 90% of the sites that we represented back then don't even exist today. Um, and, you know, I think we'll probably come on to the big idea and, and stuff around advertising. But I think from a, a creative agency point of view, going from where you were creating these big, beautifully crafted cinematic TV commercials to then having to create a four, 40, 468 by 60 banner ad. Mm. I imagine was a very, very hard shift to make. And that's why lots of digital specialist agencies, both on the media side and creative side, popped up uh, and did a really good job of kind of building websites, building microsites and building like, you know, bespoke uh, digital ads with either display or rich media. And that was the thing that I saw that was the bridge between TV and the Internet was the rise of rich media in the early uh, noughties where, you know, you're having these overlays and pop ups and stuff and, you know, people's connections still weren't quick enough to be able to do full video. You know, we were still in the age of dial-up, but what you could do is you could use kind of like, you know, you could use compressed uh, kind of animation and stuff like that to create kind of audio-visual style ads, but nothing compared to where we are today. Interesting. That's a, a phrase you don't hear so much these days, rich media. But at the time, yeah, exactly. it, was, it just goes to show, doesn't it? I mean, back then... And we're going sort of 10, 15 years back. It would have, I suppose it would have been things like Flash, which would have been the, yep. the way that they would have got across that sort of cinematic effect. Well, when did yep. video actually come into it for you? When did video become you know, not just a, a sideshow, but something which you thought was actually this is really where it's going? 
Well, I moved to Virgin Group from um, from 24/7. So when 24/7 kind of you know dot com bubble burst, uh, probably about a week after I started in digital advertising, typical timing, uh, typical timing on my behalf. And then you know there was a a bit of a, a drop off in everything, and then the, you know a lot of these American businesses that had come over kind of start to retract back over to the U.S. And so I moved across to Virgin Group, who um, it was kind of an, a startup within the Virgin Group called Virgin.net, which again was providing um, broadband or so well, at the time dial-up services uh, and uh, connectivity um, using BT's infrastructure, I think, back end, and then putting a Virgin badge on the front end, which is a classic kind of Virgin uh, business model. Um, and then we were running the brought we were running the kind of portal, uh, the the gateway that users used to come into, and you know making travel services and e-commerce and content and stuff like that available. Um, and it was during, you know, that kind of period. I think you know, 2002, I got approached by an unnamed search engine business to be their first non-US employee, mm. and I kind of just said. I'm not really sure about the future of classifieds or search engine listings. I actually, I actually much more believe in the power of moving pictures and an audio visual, which is where I'd come from. And of course that company was Google. Um, and I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now if that had happened. I'd probably be just sat on a beach somewhere. So, you know, we can always look back in hindsight and say, you know, I really wish that I'd taken that opportunity, but I did fundamentally believe in the power of moving pictures. So it was when broadband started to take off and speeds, I think, would allow people to start experimenting with video. And this was probably 2003 um, that I first started to think, OK, there could be an interesting future where the Internet um, is basically in the new gateway to, to watching TV or watching video and then. NCL and Telewest merged. They then bought Virgin Net or backward engineered onto Virgin Net's Virgin Mobile and Virgin Media was created and I was part of the launch team of that. So that was an, an incredibly amazing time because we got to essentially script, build, craft a 21st century broadband portal um, for high speed internet users and Virgin Virgin had the benefit of having fiber where no one else really did at the time. So their speeds were quicker than anyone else's and um, the real serious foray into it, I guess, was when uh, my boss came to me and said, the Premier, English Premier League have just made broadband clip rights, so highlights of all the Premier League games available for the first time. They've carved out broadband, and this was back in 2005. There was no real video advertising market then. This was pre-YouTube. YouTube didn't launch until like mid-2006. And he came to me and he said, if we bid for these rights over three seasons between 2007 and 2010, um, what do you think the maximum amount that we can make in advertising revenue would be? So we tried to build this mixed revenue, mixed model of some of it was retention of, of, of telephony customers, so kind of giving them a windowed access to this, these exclusive clips and using that to, to attract and retain customers. Um, and then there was a window that we created where it was going to be free to air and, um, and that would be available to everybody and we'd use that to then drive more people into our platform and get more people viewing this stuff. I mean, honestly, it was building a, an Excel sheet on a bunch of assumptions that we just didn't even know whether they were relevant. So we assumed £25 CPM, blah, we assumed just a number of users and, and, and then we ended up winning the rights, probably overpaying for them, I'd say. And then we just spent the next three years trying to kind of make it work. Um, so it allowed us to be able, allowed me to be able to build like sponsorship packages around premium sport rights online. So we sold a big sponsorship to Electronic Arts for the FIFA franchise back in 2006, which at the time was the biggest sponsorship deal ever done on digital in the UK, um, which included lots of stuff that you couldn't at the time do on television, like you know, because of sponsorship restrictions, we could actually put the branding over the, you know, over the top of the clips and do kind of integrated voiceovers and, and AFP. It was kind of like a hybrid of AFP and, uh, and sponsorship. Um, so it was a brilliant experience, but then, um, I kind of got the startup bug and a UK based video platform called, uh, InSkin Media that was just about to launch, which was a kind of hybrid rich media. Uh, stroke video company came to me and um, they wanted someone to launch their business commercially in the UK. So that's how I went from kind of doing, I spent eight years in Virgin Group in various roles. Um, and that was really where the video journey began. And then it kind of went into startups in 2008. Okay. So it's fascinating that journey, your, you know, your experience there, especially with the Premier League is, 
you had basically proven a business case that you could sell these premium content packages. I suppose in a similar way that it would have been sold if it was non-digital. You had that sort of comparative now, and obviously that was how it was sold externally, and also you could justify the business case internally with that. Now you're moving into this new space, you say that like the startup space, was that sort of more of the same or was it sort of now venturing more into that YouTube type model where we don't really have anything to compare it to now? How, how are we going to sell this thing? How did that go with this new business? Well, it, I mean, uh, there was the founder, there was a finance guy, there was a designer and there was one of the dudes. So I think that was basically like number five. Um, and it was interesting because they'd never really had to package and project their product before. They'd got an interesting uh, kind of like, it was basically, it was called InSkin. And what they used to do is instead of having video ad formats that are like pre-roll in front of the video, they would turn the actual video player itself, the skin of the video player, uh, into the ad. So you'd be watching a kind of three-minute football clip. And then around the border of that football clip, there would be a static uh kind of ad that was there throughout the entire view that is kind of like you know reinforcing the brand and stuff like that so it was an interesting new model it was less interruptive i'd say than kind of pre-roll and stuff like that but we were creating new inventory for publishers so we had and we you know it, it was interesting for, to me to go from the, the corporate i think when i left virgin you know as part of virgin media you know we had tens of thousands of employees um and we're offering you know quad play to the Quad play access services across TV, mobile, uh, broadband, and what's the other one? I can't remember what the fourth one was. But um, so going from this big kind of business where telco is the number one revenue driver and the ad advertising piece is a kind of nice to have to a business that's at a startup phase, has raised money, has a bunch of kind of angels and VCs, you know, kind of like looking very, very closely at how things are going and uh, and kind of having to then launch this product both on the publisher side and drive uh, this tech into publishers and then launch it on the agency side and build it. You know, we didn't really know what the revenue growth was going to be like, what the uptake was going to be like, but we had a very, very good story around, uh, tech, new types of advertising, non-intrusive advertising and very, very high dwell times because people were staying with the ad for like three minutes surrounding the player. So there was a, there was a bunch of like stuff that we could talk about. And really when we think about, uh, advertising today and digital advertising today when we think about the things that people are really interested in uh which is viewability you know what percentage of my ad is actually on the screen when it's been shown and then view through rate or completion rate what length of time is a user spending with my uh with my ad we almost preempted that 10 years ago mm. um by building these formats so we were on the right direction of travel. We built that business. We, you know, we built the UK business into a really good business. Then we started to scale it into North, uh, to Scandinavia, uh, into Europe. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it was an incredible experience of, you know, my first foray into having no shield of any corporate protection. You know, we didn't have office assistance. We didn't have, you know, everything that we did. Um, we had to do ourselves, you know, right from kind of like the company and um, the administration and setting up all the systems and Salesforce and, you know, everything from scratch. So that gave me a really good grounding in kind of what's being an entrepreneur on the absolute coal face with a decent product, but then having to, you know, go to market uh, is all about. Mm. It's interesting because you kind of found yourself back in that situation more recently, didn't you? You went from your startup into Unruly, you grew Unruly, yeah. you moved then from Europe to Asia, to Singapore to run things. And it was almost like going back into that loop once yeah. again, you were back in the startup mode. Tell us about, I don't want to sort of like rough shot over, you know, the whole Unruly history, because we we'll go a bit and talk about social video yep. in a minute. But starting yep. up in Asia, how was that again? Tell us about that story when you moved to Asia to set up this social video. Well, what was a well, successful business outside of Asia? Well, I mean, I guess I've probably got quite a low boredom threshold. So I kind of, you know, went into one really as UKMD, then basically within a year, then said I want to help you expand into Europe and then expanded Europe to six offices. Um, and then we were getting, you know, we had quite a lot of Asian clients. So um, you know, we had stuff coming out of Korea with some of the big brands in Korea. We had stuff, of, you know, like a growing business in Japan. And uh, and I always used to stop over in Singapore on the way. And so some of our global clients were asking us to do business with uh, campaigns for them in, in Southeast Asia and stuff like that. So um, I found myself on a plane every 12 weeks. Then it became every eight weeks. Then it became every six weeks. Then it became every four weeks. And my wife and I had just had a, you know, we, we had a young, young boy who was about, you know, you know, 
when we when we moved to Asia, he was 18 months old. So between zero and when he was 18 months, I was getting on a plane and an increasing amount. And my wife is from New Zealand, um, and she's actually half Malaysian. So she's got a lot of family that's still in Malacca and family in Singapore. So um, we kind of looked at where was halfway house to kind of be able to service the grandparents um, between Britain and uh, New Zealand. And, you know, the fact that I was constantly getting on a plane and our Asia business, Asia pack business was starting to explode. And I just kind of said to my boss, the CEO, uh, Scott, um, I was like, look, you know, if they're all saying to us now, we really love your product. But if you are serious about Asia and you want to grow this anymore, you've got to do as the courtesy of being here because it's almost a bit insulting for you to take our money and then service us eight hours behind or nine hours behind, which is valid. So we uh, so I lobbied my boss. We got it done. And um, and so we kind of made the move out here April 2014. Um, and I've got to say, Graham. Um, the first six months was absolutely brutal. Um, How? I don't think I was quite prepared um, for the velocity of work, let's say. Um, so, you know, when you come and do business travel and business trips, you kind of like, you know, you'll park yourself in a nice hotel, you'll work hard, you'll do lots of meetings, you'll do some follow-ups in the evening, you'll go out and have some drinks, all that kind of stuff. Some of you work in the day might be by a pool or whatever it might be. But when you come here with a young family where your wife doesn't know anyone and you've got a young kid and... Um, you've got no support network, no infrastructure. Um, you have to find the office space, do the hiring, do the you know do the setup, everything, supply and demand side, build the publishers, do it you know do everything. Um, you end up working a full Asia day, and then you end up working a full London day. Wow! And there was uh, nothing set up when you there was no office space, nothing when you day one. Well, we, you, we had a shared we we managed to get a shared working space over in the co, which is one of the work right. uh, which is the one of the co-ops in Singapore. Um, so we did that and stuff like that, but you know, we kind of had that, but like, you know, just really kind of basic mundane stuff that you just don't think about, you know, like getting an employment pass in Singapore so that you can actually get some utilities in your house and a, and a mobile phone and all that kind of stuff. You just don't realize the, the amount of kind of like admin, both work and personal that you have to deal with. Anyway, um, I'm not getting the violin out. Um, it was, it was tough and it taught me that, um, both m- myself and my wife are extremely resilient. Um, because she was, you know, at the end of a full day, she was wanting to talk because she'd only talked to an 18 month old boy and I would mm. come home and just basically just be like, you know, I've had 10 meetings. I can't talk to anybody. So there's this weird paradox going on in our lives, but she met people and built up a kind of support network of mums and giving, you know, Singapore is an incredibly friendly, welcoming place. Um, I hired some people, the business demand rocketed, you know, we did extremely, extremely well, really quickly and, and expanded it. And now there are 60 unruly's across. I think seven officers in APAC, seven officers. So we've got one in Tokyo, one in Seoul, uh, two in Australia, Singapore, New Delhi, Mumbai. Um, and we're about to open uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and, um, and Thailand and the Philippines. Mm. So, um, you know, it's been an incredible journey of building an amazing brand. And really, has got a fantastic reputation in the market. We've got an absolutely brilliant team. And also, you know, we had the benefit of being acquired by News Corp in September 2015. So, um, you know, as part of being in APAC, I was looking to grow a lot of the revenue, you know, grow revenue significantly and provide quite a big growth engine and a growth story for Unruly. And at the same time, expanding to Australia. And obviously, Australia is where News Corp is kind of, you know, global HQ and heritage is. So um, that acquisition has been brilliant for us. And now we're part of obviously one of the biggest global media uh, groups and we benefit from you know their reach their publications their scale um, but while still retaining our identity and still running an autonomous business within within that overall wider group so I think that also gave us a huge accelerator uh, into Australia um, mm. because you know we, we benefit from their economies of scale in that market yeah and, and just looking at the the Asian market in general um, just to throw some stats out there as well. I mean, yeah. obviously, you're in a great place to be right now. The Just some stats here. Ad spend in APAC alone increased 63% or is projected to increase 63% between 2016 and 2018, according yeah. to eMarketer. And just the ad side of things on mobile will reach, well, forecast to reach just under, shy of $90 billion by 2020. When you look at the Asian market in general, I know you mentioned all these countries that you're expanding into. Is do you see, you know, that things are a little bit different from, you know, your background in Europe? 
you, you've come from a traditional uh, media background, moved into mm. moved into digital. So there was, there's a bit of, you know, you worked with those entities and then you worked in the digital space and now you're in Asia. How is it the same and how is it different to the ad space from, you know, what you're used to back in Europe? Um, well, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, Asia Pack is basically the, the kind of engine room of digital growth globally and probably advertising growth in general. So 51% of all mobile internet users globally are now based in Asia Pacific. Um, and it's uh, Asia Pacific's ad spend is set to over, or digital ad spend is set to overtake the US and it be, you know, become the largest digital ad market in the world in the next couple of years. So, you know, there's reasons to be cheerful. And I'm just glad that we came at that particular moment in time because I think had we come to Singapore before 2014, the market, you know, probably wasn't ready for some of the sophistication around some of the stuff that we, we were bringing and talking about, like, you know, psychology and, and you know, creating better uh, creative assets using science. Um, but in answer to your question, um, you know, the, the beauty of Asia Pacific uh, is that it's so diverse and every different market has its own set of nuance. Um but a lot of the trends are kind of macro trends following a similar direction. So you can benefit from the winds of the macro trends in terms of rapid digitization and connectivity of, of, of consumers. Um, of course, it's mobile first, which means that we have to think about things in a very different way. So, you know, I think the West has a lot of the ad tech companies coming to Asia uh, traditionally were kind of quite flash based because the majority of their revenues were coming from, uh, you know, the Western markets where, you know, there's still quite desktop uh, heavy culture. And then you come to APAC and, you know, Chrome and Google decide to deprecate Flash from the browser and stuff like that. And I think a lot of the Western ad tech companies weren't necessarily as ready as they could have been um, in terms of being able to serve all their video ads out and stuff like that in HTML5. We kind of saw this coming. Um, and so we made sure that we basically, you know, stopped building out in Flash and start building out purely in HTML5 probably earlier than everyone else did because we knew this mobile first world was coming at us at a rapid pace um so i think we've benefited from having that tech available to be able to kind of you know as soon as google chrome switches off flash well it's not going to cause us a problem and our reach still isn't going to drop so uh, this is one of the you know i i think australia new zealand is obviously a you know a territory unique to itself it's got the highest ad spend per capita um globally and it's a very sophisticated ecosystem in itself so i speak to clients quite often in in Australia who will report up to the regional lead in um, Singapore because of, it's an APAC, you know, they're an APAC, part of an APAC business. But actually when they're looking for the trends and what's happening in digital and, the, you know, like uh, technology and viewability and brand safety and, you know, ad verification and all these things, they're actually looking to their counterparts in the US and the UK uh, because Australia is kind of akin to those more akin to those markets in terms of like the way that people use the internet and and the kind of ad tech ecosystem so i think we can take that out of the mix um you know southeast asia is incredibly you know like singapore is hugely you know has huge very high levels of connectivity probably the highest level of smartphone penetration in the world um but ad, but, but, but digital ad spend only is still 16 to 20 percent of uh, of the market mm. so I think this is what we're seeing and this is the opportunity even though usage is is basically you know is incredible you know and, and markets like Japan which is like probably one of the most technologically advanced markets in the world where usage of of, of online video and and, and, and mobile um, I think they went straight you know they almost went straight to mobile data without kind of using the voice as much um, um, and you know, I mean you'll know that more than I because you live there um, but the ad spend isn't necessarily following um, the media usage and consumption. And I think this is because we still, you know, there's, there's a bit more risk aversion in some of these traditional markets. Um, best practices still haven't necessarily trickled down. Um, how, how does so that compare with other markets? I know you mentioned Singapore 16 to 20 percent without putting yeah, you on yeah. the spot. We're not asking for scientific you know, fact, but roughly compared to what that would be. Well, Japan's like. about the same. I think Japan's only, I mean, Japan's the third largest ad market in the world. And, you know, I know more about online video as a percentage you spend, you know, online video this year, I think in, in Japan will, uh, is, is rumored to be around the 700 million, um, US dollar marker. Right. Um, and I think overall ad spend is 61 billion. So it's, 
it's fractional uh, as, a, as a share of overall traditional spend. Right. Um, I think a lot of the other markets in Southeast Asia, you know, Indian, Indonesia, which is obviously uh, huge from a kind of like digital reach point of view and, and growing, um, Philippines, so on and so forth. These guys are probably at the teens, if not lower, um, in terms of like digital ad spend. Yet, you know, we're going to have pretty quickly 120 million, 140 million people online in uh, in Indonesia and so on and so forth. So these mm. countries are absolutely vast. And India, a lot of people discount India in terms of the Asia pack thing, but um, India is going to pretty soon have the largest population in the world. Um, it's going to overtake China. And, um, you know, the Which, digital supply there is insane. The exactly. attitude to data is very good. There's a huge amount of scale in first party, uh, third party data. Um, so I think, you know, these markets like, you know, the Indias and, you know, China, of course, is just the world's most sophisticated online video ad market um, globally. So from a video standpoint, I mean, I just think the only way can be up. And this is why it's incredibly exciting to be here. Mm. Let's also talk about young people, because, you know, obviously this is something that we can comment on from the, the statistic side, but also from the personal side as well. You're, I know you mentioned, just trying to do the math here, that you're... The, your youngest boy is it your oldest boy i don't know i mean he would he be five or he's, six now he's just uh he's five this weekend on, on sunday all right happy birthday so he's five years old has he discovered yeah. youtube yet no well yeah of course he has discovered youtube um so i mean we he knows how to operate it and he's known how to operate it on the ipad probably since he was about two um <laughs> so he can't he can't actually he can't actually log into uh you know we have to kind of log in for him but then we, you know, we, we, they've got their own iPad, the kids, so we've got a five-year-old boy and a twin girls or two and a half. Um, and they, they kind of navigate around all the kind of nursery rhymes and the kind of mm. cartoons and stuff like that. We limit their exposure, Graham. They do, do do other things other than just, uh, of course. watch YouTube. But, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty good at navigating around and being able to kind of, um, end one cartoon that may not be delivering the, the value that they desire and start another one. Exactly. I mean, it's just fascinating, isn't it? And this is something that I think, you know, when you look at the future of advertising and media in general, just look at what young people are doing today on YouTube or any of these platforms, and not just in terms of consuming content, but discovering. And mm. I know this is something which I think the the music industry has come quite late to the, the table, realizing that actually, you know, if you want to reach young people today, they ain't discovering it through the same channels that they're used to. I mean, the same no. way that people discover brands, it, it's through channels like YouTube now, right? It's through channels where that's where they're discovering anything, everything. And it's not necessarily the official channel that they're discovering it through. It's through the covers of covers or, you know, people talking about this stuff. So it's, it's, it's a completely new media model, isn't it? In terms of how people are discovering brands, how they're discovering content. You know, they're doing it in a way which I guess would challenge a lot of that traditional advertising, especially when we talk about things like the big idea advertising. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, young people, they're not connecting with that anymore. They're, they're looking at what other young people are consuming. And if, you know, a young person does a react to video of this, that's how they're going to find out about it, right? So, you know, I find that I mean, really word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, word of mouth's always been a really strong channel, right? Peer-to-peer -peer endorsement, I think it's one of the most trusted media well it is the most trusted media channel according to research um but i think that becomes even more so in uh, you know as you say the next generation the kind of digital natives however, however you want to call them um and you know as you say you know the the, the things that they do and the you know because i think back in the day when you just had a, a tv and it was a very social thing and you had a linear schedule and you kind of planned your time around when your favorite shows like 18 or whatever it was you know showing my age was on or bionic man uh, featuring steve you know with steve austin um, um you kind of planned around those events whereas now because we're in a full in control on demand kind of like you know uh ecosystem you know everything that we do um we expect almost to be instantaneous so you know whether you know we we, we want a cab or a car you know we use a kind of uh, you know, someone like Uber to get it. Uber then tells us, okay, it's going to take you 40 minutes to get home. In that 40 minutes, here are a range of uh, eateries that can deliver to you by the time you get home. So you, you know, your kind of your your journey home plus your food delivery is on demand. You know, if we want to get, if you want to have a date, you know, we can go on dating apps and swipe left or swipe right. You know, so I think you know we have this instantaneous culture and seeing our children and watching them 
you know, constantly flick between these different videos if they kind of get, you know, marginally bored. I think this is why we start to talk about the fact that we're seeing more attention deficit. And um, this has a big challenge for advertisers because um, if we try and, you know, we're still humans and we still respond to human stories. And I think the power of storytelling in advertising and the emotion that creates and then the, 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 the memory, the long term deep memory structures and subconscious structures that those kind of like emotional stories create that's never going to change. So how can we create stories that we can, that, that we can insert into certain, you know, internet touch points with our audiences throughout the day and understand at what moment in time and what device and, and basically based on someone's context or location or even mood, um, we should be, you know, what kind of like content we should be serving to them at that moment in time. Um, and whether we can use, we can we can create content that is is so good that we get people then to endorse it for us so consumers then share because one of the things that we've seen is that um the only ads that i watch on facebook are videos that someone's actually shared to me um so if someone i know has shared me a video i'm much even if it's an ad or a non-ad then i'm much more likely to watch it rather than an ad uh, something that i know is an actual ad and it's been force fed to me and i think this is a conditioning that consumers have uh, from an advertising perspective, as soon as they see a logo, um, they kind of switch off. Mm. Um, we really have had to grab their attention with something meaningful before we can show the logo. And I think this is one of the biggest areas of debate right now around creating content for the Facebook generation, you know, ads, video ads for the Facebook generation. Do you start with the logo? Do you start with something else? And um, it's an incredibly interesting time because there's so much opinion and there are so many different fragments of platforms. And uh, it's, I think back to the creative agency, it's an incredibly tough time for them to be able to create the breadth of different assets that they're going to need to be able to um, inject uh, ads into all the different touch points that consumers mm. have throughout the day. So when you look at, I mean, Facebook are obviously now going long on new technologies like virtual reality or augmented reality. Mm. And that's, opening up i suppose in in the traditional sense that's more real estate for advertising yeah in, in just in a way you know the old eastern europe was opened up to advertisers back in the day you know it's just like okay yeah. now we suddenly have 200 million more consumers so when you look at something like vrar come onto the scene wow. bearing in mind what you just talked about do you see that now as something like in the same way that video was back in the day okay here's a new technology this is how we need to go into it, or do you think it needs something completely different to, you know, m make advertising work in that space? Because you know, if people aren't paying attention to the logos or the ad messages, then it's just all going to become noise, isn't it? How do you get into a space like that? Because I know you're active in this space as well. You've been, you know, something some of the projects you're involved in it. How do you feel yeah. that ad agencies, ad networks can make sense of something like that? Are they going to be ready for it when Facebook finally flicks the switch and unleashes it upon us? Um, well, I mean. Having, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a few angel investments around and one of the companies that I've invested in is a, a Scandinavian company in the VR, AR mixed reality space uh, called Adverti. They're, you know, the, the, uh, Nicholas, the founder, um, you know, they've got a lot of history in kind of like gaming and uh, entertainment and uh, mobile in, in that market. And they're building technology that provides the kind of like ad infrastructure for the immersive world. Um, and I do believe that we're, you know, we've gone, f we've, we're in, you know, we've gone from the age of interactivity to the age of social and we're about to enter the age of immersion. Um, and the age of immersion is, you know, these immersive experiences will become greater and greater and the technology will become better and they'll become more commonplace. And um, you're going to need infrastructure that I think is built and fit for purpose that will allow advertisers to be able to bid on real estate that may be in all sorts of different worlds and different types of environments uh, that, that are the, the, these kind of like immersive worlds. Um, but do we have and, that go back to Second Life where, you know, I think Microsoft bought an island and Second Life. Yeah. Uh, is that just sounds quite familiar. I mean, I know that you're just giving us a, a, a 101 on it, but that, are we sort of back there or have we sort of moved on from that and it's sort of a different approach to advertising in those kind of... I think, well, the... I mean, Second World was obviously very niche. Um, there were very, you know, early adopters that were using that in terms of this kind of like avatar-based, you know, uh, self. 
in these worlds and it did create a, an ecosystem around it for a while but you know the tech at that time I think was probably prohibitive and the the look and feel and the level of immersion I think was was still quite limited you know you probably still had to suspend some belief to think that you were actually really there whereas I think the next generation VR, AR, mixed reality, you know, we are going to be able to immerse ourselves fully in these spaces. And when we are, I think we're going to be much more receptive to uh, the kinds of messages that we get given um, and the content that we can unlock in those. And some of that content that we can unlock in those immersive worlds may be ad-funded and um, some of the credits or things that we need to to be able to kind of like navigate these worlds and get further into them or into the games, maybe ad funded as well. But I think the key thing to all advertising going forward is that in an, in an age of infinite choice, um, where consumers have more and more choice, um, we have to make stuff that has a value exchange. Um, and I think this is obviously one of the things that a lot of the ad ecosystem have overlooked. The advertising has always been a value exchange. So TV advertising, you know, it was a quid pro quo between um, you have to watch some ads in return to get this great content that we've brought to you. And in, you know, social gaming, then we watch a video ad to get credits so we can get further into the games. You know, and everything in between, um, a magazine, the cost of a magazine is subsidized by the advertising that's in there. And so if we want to continue to be relevant to consumers in the era of infinite change and infinite immersion, we have to be able to deliver something to them that is of value as well as telling about how good we are in terms of our features and benefits. And so um, we who's, just have who's to... Who's getting it right? Who, who do you see in that space brand-wise who actually is really you know, pushing all the right buttons when it comes to digital and even it may be in these new spaces like these new immersive right. environments? Well, I mean, look, look, Red Bull has navigated from being an advertiser to being a brand and content owner. Not every brand can do that. I think, you know, Red Bull set out their store very, very early on to, to own uh, exhilaration or own extreme, you know, sponsor events themselves and, uh, or make events themselves and, and build new categories and, and around kind of like, you know, competitive uh, air sports and stuff like that you know they've been incredibly powerful at doing that and they've built themselves into a massive brand and content owner that have got huge kind of like superstars in all the different kind of extreme sports and then leverage those really well and build huge amounts of content off it and you know all of that is incredible but um, you know you, not every brand can do that but uh, I think you can still understand your consumer and what a kind of like personality or psychological level makes your consumer tick and then you can create stories around your brand and your brand personality that um, that allow you to be able to create an experience or something of, of use or something that's engaging or entertaining for that consumer or build some kind of emotional connection with them. And then later on down the line, once you've established that equity or that connection, then sure, you might be appropriate to then start hitting them with, you know, 10 second response or reminder ads that are more kind of rational and features and benefits based. But unless we have created that emotional equity um, with that consumer in the first place by by entertaining them or, or giving them content that's interesting, then I don't think we've earned the right to sell to them. And this is what we talk about or what I talk about a lot, which is earning the right to sell to a consumer. You know, we're moving into an era where we no longer can buy the trust and attention of the consumer. We have to earn it. I think that's uh, that's the subject yes. for another conversation, isn't it? We haven't even touched, we haven't even scratched the surface of psychometrics. I know we put that on our to-do list for today, and that's such a deep subject as it stands on its own. But that's the subject maybe of, of a part two. We could we could go into depth about that because that in its own is fascinating because that opens up a whole new area, a whole new playing field. You're talking about Facebook. You're talking about a whole new branch of psychology as well when it comes to advertising. So. That's all to come. That's Phil Townend, everybody, ad tech entrepreneur. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.